Hi, and welcome to Time Out Coaching with Coach Tony Gobolotto. Today, we welcome a rising star of British coaching, currently the head coach of the Great Britain Under-18s program and head coach of the City of Edinburgh Basketball Club, winner of numerous national championships. Please welcome Coach Craig Nicholl. Coach, Hi, good morning. how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for inviting me on. Awesome. Um, let's start straight away because uh, there's so much to cover. Um, you've got such a great story. So yeah. let's talk about firstly how you got involved in basketball and, you know, if that influenced you also to get in for, uh, involved in coaching as well. Um, yeah, well, I, I first got involved in basketball when I was really young. Um, I must have been around 10 um, and I started going to, to basketball sessions. Um, I was... Um, I was really quite small at the time, so I first started going to, to the classes. No one really passed me the ball or anything. And my biggest memory of it is actually wanting to quit. And I didn't I didn't want to say I didn't want to keep going. Um, but my parents, they forced me to stay in. They had a, a, a philosophy that I had to, if I committed to doing something, I had to commit to it. So they made me keep going for future sessions. And then um, obviously went back a bit more. And after, after about two months, I started to enjoy it a bit more and you know, I ended up sticking with it and staying with basketball all the way through and, you know, played up until I was about 16. Um, and unfortunately, I broke my elbow in three places and uh, um, stopped playing for quite a while. But my coaches at the time said, well, why don't you pick up coaching? So I started coaching a primary school class at that point. That's sort of my my entry into how I got involved with, uh, with basketball and got coaching real early on my journey. Um, and then coaching very quickly sort of took over did you um at this this early stage this playing stage was there yeah. um was there any kind of uh, like standout coaches that were coaching you were you was this also i would assume at the time of there would have been before the, the glasgow rocks this would have been the edinburgh rocks days yeah. so we've there's a huge history of British basketball, but it's Scottish basketball. And there are some really prominent people that are involved. And so I was wondering if those people were touched you at, at, at that early stage as well. Yeah. Um, so well, I remember, I remember going to watch Edinburgh and Scottish Rocks games when I was, when I was really young, we went, went along quite a lot to watch those games, but um, you know, there's quite a few coaches. Paul Easton in particular was quite a big influence. He was my club coach at the time, under 16 coach. Um, and he was, a, he was a really big influence, firstly, on me as a, as a player, and it sort of really helped me improve on and off court and just my, sort of my general overall confidence. And I was quite a shy kid when I was young. Um, so he, he really helped with that side of things and then pushed me into the coaching side of things. And you know, I learned a lot from him early on. Um, but yeah, and then it's also pretty hard. I remember, not, not necessarily specifically with coaching, but... Um, Robert Archibald was part of our club, well, used to be part of our club. He was playing in the NBA at the time. Um, but I remember every summer he would come back and he would be around practice. So he'd come in and work out with the team or he just, with the younger, younger age groups, he'd be standing around the side. So it was sort of really inspiring just to see yeah. someone that come from Dunfermline, which is where I'm from, sure. uh, which is a relatively small club um, in the grand scheme of things, to someone that's gone and played in college and gone and at the time was playing in the NBA. So that, that was really inspiring. As a, as a 14, 15 year old kid um, to think about that. Great. And so you say you started coaching, you know, and that is a young age, um, you know, so do you, did you take any uh, coaching awards there at that time at the, you know, around the 16, 17 year old range or what, what, what did you start doing, um, you know, as a coach at that time? Yeah, I think I did the, I think it was called Getting Started Basketball Award or something. It was like the lowest level. I think it took about an hour, maybe two hours to do, um, which I, I was really young at the time. So I was always a little bit, what's going on here? Um, but then I was just sort of thrown in at the deep end. It was only, it was primary school stuff. So obviously now it seems like it's really quite straightforward stuff. But at the time, as a as a 16-year-old, I was only you know five or six years older than the people that I was in coaching. So it was a... It was a, it was still quite intimidating at the time. You'd go in and it'd be a, a school teacher there, and you'd have to stand up in front of the school teacher and lead their class and stuff. So it was it was a little bit challenging as a as a young kid, but you know it was thrown into the deep end and just sort of rolled with it. And uh, do you think that there. those 
just quick question. Do you think that those that those early experiences like I've always found that, you know, when if you've done a lot of those type of community sessions, uh, school sessions, you know, young junior club sessions where you're coaching a lot of children, you learn to be really good at group organization, which is a big part of like high level coaching, you know, is like constant quick repetition of moving on from drills and being able to move people into different areas. Do you think that that really helped you and has helped you? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was all, like, I always feel like when I'm put into a situation where I felt a little bit out of my depth, which at the time as, as a young guy I did, it, was, it really sort of helped. It opens up my eyes and try and soak as much stuff in as possible. So, you know, recognizing having to plan sessions down to every single little detail so that you've not got kids running off from various places and, and still being able to keep, you know, sort of the best players engaged because you want them to enjoy it and continue on the sport and, some kids that are just there for a run around, you got to keep them under control as well. So it was, it was a big vary of a variant of skill levels to try and control, keep control of, which you know definitely laid a foundation for the planning and preparation that goes all the way through your coaching career. Yeah, and so from these early primary school sessions, what was your next uh, coaching stop? You know, this next part of your journey. Yeah, so when when I moved up to the under 18s team at um, Dunfermline, um, I started helping out with the under 16s team. Um, so I was playing for the 18s, assisting with the under 16s, um, and again that's that was just another um, case of really opening my eyes to what was happening and and what part of coaching actually is and how you actually have to prepare for games and you know think about development of players over a whole season. It's not just a primary school class where you've got them for you know, once a week for a, a, ter a term or a semester, you know, you, you've actually got to think about these guys over the over the whole course of the season. So that 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 became really interesting. Yeah, and it's it was still relatively low level stuff. It was Lothian League, local league in Scotland. So it was, you know, nothing nothing to shout home about. But it's you know, it's it sort of the first stop for really starting to think about game coaching and mm. sort of season management stuff. And you know, as as I went on to university from there, that's I, stayed in touch with Dunfermline and I kept coaching the, the under 16s team from there um, until I went on to to coach with Falkirk because that just was a little bit closer um, to Stirling University. I ended up coaching under 16s there as well. So it was quite a big part of my early years were working with the under 16 age group. Right. And, you know, getting into, you know, working with Falkirk, I mean, that obviously was must have been a you know a, a step up and you know obviously some really key characters of you know Scottish basketball involved um talk to me about that and you know was there some people that were really going to influence you you know more importantly about your actual coaching philosophy there that, you know starting to build this kind of you know philosophy up yeah um well I worked quite closely with uh with Neil Connell you know he's, he's probably just doesn't coach just now anymore, but um, he was the one that sort of got me in with Falkirk. So I was, I was finding the travel back to Dunfermline was a little bit too much. Um, so I, Falkirk was much closer. So I ended up going to, to coach there. Um, it was really quite, you know, we, we would train more than we did with the Dunfermline team. Um, seemed to be a little bit more higher achieving. So uh, we actually had quite a successful team there. Fraser, Fraser Malcolm, actually, that um, you would know, he, he was part of that team as a, Right. He was under 14 playing as an under 16. Um, it's actually quite interesting the amount of players that are in that that under 16 group that I worked with that are now through playing senior basketball or playing various places. It's really quite quite nice to think about. But it was, you know, it was it was good to work with work with those players there and, and the framework. They've got you know lots of committed players. It was a lot wider base than what I was used to used to working with with a smaller club at, at the time with Dunfermline. Sure. And were you, at that time, did you have some core kind of components or values that you were starting to build on? Maybe, you know, like, you know, you taught defense in a certain way or you wanted the teams to, to, to play a certain way offensively. Were you starting to think like this or was it just, again, more about teaching the fundamentals and, you know, trying to be competitive? What, what, were, what were your yeah. thoughts in that respect? I think it probably happened quite a lot without really thinking about it. If you think about it now, it was it was sort of happening organically. But you know, once you get more experience, you write all this stuff down. You've got your clear plan. I was, yeah. I was 19, 20, 20 years old. I was kind of just rolling with it. 
Um, but you know, I, I had my fo my focus was defense because I was the assistant to Neil, and um, so he did the offense and I did the defense. So I then based a lot of my sort of learning, all the stuff I was trying to learn about was focused on defense. So I sort of developed an early sort of love of teaching that side of the game, um, which probably still feeds through into what I do now. I, I consider myself to be quite heavily focused on the defensive side of things. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's a, that 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 would probably be very um, act at the start of my journey that was important to rule with. And and uh, is there anyone that you're looking to at this moment, like who's inspiring you, either whether they were in Scotland or whether they domestically or whether they were, you know, were you looking at some college coaches in America, NBA coaches? What was what was the thought, or were you just you you were doing this for the love of the game, and there still wasn't this kind of light bulb moment that this is the direction you want to be as a coach. Yeah, I mean, at, at the time, I had no idea that I wanted to be a full time coach. Yeah, that, that was that was never a thought at the time. But I was committed to getting better and trying to develop. But I mean, there wasn't much in terms of courses or anything that I, that we could go on at the time. It was just it was just a case of trying to learn as much as you could. On online courses didn't really exist either. There wasn't much from <laughs> early in the days of YouTube and stuff. So there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, I do remember watching a lot of college basketball and and trying to. You know, I, I've still got notebooks around where I'm taking notes of stuff that I've just seen where like little tiny stuff about out of bounds plays or whatever. And um, that that was kind of where I got my early base from. You know, again, if I was to look back at it now, it would probably be very basic and simple. But um, it was kind of kind of the only real way that we had of watching or being involved with basketball at the time. So. Right. Okay, that's interesting. So from the University Falkirk, what, what was the next stage? And was there like, did you, was there any time that you actually you said, you said to yourself, actually, you know, I really love being involved in the sport and I want to try to find a route that gets me into something um, that I get paid for and I could do this full time? Yeah, it's actually, it's quite, um, so I've been, I've been at uni for a few years by this point. Um, and my original degree, I was doing computing and maths at university. Um, and uh, I remember it must have been about 2010 um, because the Commonwealth Games had just been announced that it was going to be in Australia in 2018. So it was just past now. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, that's something that I really want to do. You know, so I was, I was still, what, 22, 23-ish. Um, and I, it felt like it was quite of a big stretch goal at the time, but I really wanted to focus on my efforts and, that was something I really wanted to do. And I remember thinking that very early on and I made a lot of conscious decisions about what I wanted to do to try and make it there to be part of the squad that went to the Commonwealth Games. Um, so one of the first things I did was, uh, I, so I, fin I finished my undergraduate degree at university and then I wrote to the university because I wanted to change because University of Stirling was very good for their sports coaching very course much so. and yeah. for postgrad. Um, so I wrote to them saying that I wanted to change sort of my major from computing side of things to sports side of things. And I remember I got a little bit of pushback, um, but then I, I told them I was, I was doing some uh, Scotland international stuff at the time. And I was you know, laid out my, my process of what I wanted to do. And they let me on the course. So I switched over to do sports coaching. Um, so I did a, sport, a, a sports coaching masters. Um, and that sort of then laid the foundation to open up some opportunities to go and coach full time. Um, I moved to, it was quite a quite a big risk as for a, a Scottish guy that you know no one at the time really did coaching or wasn't really you know it was the only full time coaching job in Scotland was the Rocks head coach job you know, was, there was no other coaches around doing it so I guess it could be seen as a bit of a risk um, but uh, I interviewed for a job down with Medway Park Crusaders at the time that's right yep. Crusaders but they called Medway Park at the time. Um, with James Veer and Jesse Suzanne. So I went down and worked with them um, for about three years, um, which sort of really opened my eyes to, to basketball. And, and it, was, it was a total different mantra to what I'd been used to in Scotland. I, I got to a point where I was quite comfortable in Scotland and I was you know, doing reasonably well, but then going down south, um, playing in the, the South Premier, playing in the EABL and you know, being involved with the men's team as well, it, was, it really opened my eyes to what, full-time basketball actually was sure. and the more I did it the more I was like this is something I really want to do um, yeah. and I've tried to shape almost everything I've done from there to continue on from that 
So obviously that's the relationship you have with James and, and obviously Jesse has, you know, come up two or three times, you know, over the series of, uh, of coaches that I've taught to such a, um, someone that's actually developed coaches, you know, and, and really shaped some coaches and their futures. What, tell me, tell me some of the things that you learned from him and, uh, that you've taken into your coaching. Yeah, no, it was, it was really good being there. Cause he, he, he really challenged me to, to think, um, outside of what I was already doing, outside my comfort zone. Um, so it, it was really important for me. You know, I, I thought I had a pretty strong base of where I was before I went there. Um, but I remember, you know, we used to do coach development meetings quite a lot. And I've still got some of the sheets as well, where we'd take some notes on, you know, areas I wanted to improve on. And it's interesting looking back at what my, some of my perceived weaknesses were at the time. And I was like, oh, in mean, you're thinking now, you know, seven, eight years later, I was like, well, actually I have worked on that pretty well in the last sure. seven or eight years. Um, so he, he, you know, he was, he was very good to work with um, and, and learn from on the, on the floor. James as well. Um, was learned a lot from both of them. Do you think, uh, I was going to come back to this question. I will come back to it a little bit later in a bigger way, but um, you know, do you think that that's a route that, other younger co uh, Scottish coaches should think about, you know, um, or do you think it was, you know, it was just the right place at the right time for you um, to be able to, to, to experience different, a, a different way of doing things, uh, maybe with some different level of players or different types of players in reality? Yeah. Um, well, no, there's sort of both ways would work now. Um, I mentioned that at the time there was only really one coaching job in Scotland with the Rocks. Um, now more coaches, more teams, sorry, in Scotland have coaching positions. You know, they, they come in different ways. Some of them focus on community level stuff. Some of them focus on a little bit more elite level stuff. But there is more full time coaches in Scotland, so it's not it's not one hundred percent essential to go away. But for me, it was the, it was the best thing that I could have done because um, it, it took me out of Scotland relative population wise. You know, probably level-wise in international basketball is very small in comparison to England, in comparison to Europe, in comparison to the world. So the more that you can get out and go out and experience different situations, you know, that's what really helped me expand my coaching knowledge it was just being in a bigger, more challenging situation. So if you have the chance to go away, I would absolutely recommend it. Um, but there is also opportunities within Scotland as well. Um, you know, I've, I've got a very good assistant working with me just now who's a good up and coming coach, Katie McPherson. Um, you know, she just came straight out of university and we're trying, I'm trying to do the similar sort of things with what Jesse and James did with me sure. in those early years. I'm trying to then pass on and do with her just now. So, right. And so now you're coaching, you know, you're coaching some, I mean, you've coached many, many good players throughout your career, but um, you're coaching these, you know, more athletic players down in the South. Um, you're competing at, you know, pretty high level. Are you changing how you're coaching uh, in a big way? Is there something that Jesse kind of influenced you and you said, right, look, I'm going to pivot this way? Or were you just, you know, it was more about the structure and reaffirming some things and, and just yeah. slight tweaks on your philosophy? I think, I think it was important to be, and I, and I still apply this to quite to every new sort of situation I'm in now, but to, is to be adaptive to the people that are around you. So, you know, uh, you mentioned it's very different in terms of the athleticism between the players that you'll get down in the London area compared to what you'll get up in Scotland, which is, which is probably different in national team wise as well. So um, I, I wouldn't say I have any one set way I have of, of of coaching, you know, I can be very adaptive with the tools that you've sort of worked with. So, sure. you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and make a lot of personal relationships with players and then and build off that and feed off what gets them going and what they like doing and then create situations out of that for them, whether that be in an offensive or defensive situation to put them in positions where they're going to succeed, you know, and then they're going to enjoy it. Because the more they enjoy it, the more they're going to buy into it. And then you can sure. sort of grow your system from there. So from Kent, uh, from the from the Medway Kent Crusaders situation, where what was the next stage after that? Yeah, um, so I moved I moved back up to Edinburgh. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do at the time. Um, I was trying to explore some some other stuff, whether to go away or um, trying to get some trying to get 
a coaching profession. I want to keep it going. Uh, again, it was still at the time where there wasn't really any full-time jobs in Scotland, so it wasn't really an option. So I came home just sort of as a, as a, a holding stock to see what was going on. And I ended up working with City of Edinburgh Basketball. Um, so the coaches there, it was sort of by luck that I ended up coaching with them. So I'd coached national teams um, from 14s all the way through to 18s. And then that summer, so it must have been, i trying to remember, probably 2012, was due to be the first summer that I wasn't going to coach national teams. Um, it was the year before, I'd still lived down south and I'd travelled up to Scotland every second weekend to go to practice. Wow. It cost, cost a lot of money to go up tight. It took basically my entire weekend. To, so I'd sometimes have a game with Medway Park on the Saturday I would then get the overnight bus back to Scotland to coach on the Sunday and then get the overnight bus back to get back for practice awesome. on Monday morning. So it was, it, it was a, it was a big, you know, time and effort expense to try and do it. So I decided to take the next summer. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do the national team side of things. Um, but then I, I decided right, once I wanted to go back to Scotland, a, a last minute position became available with the under 18 Scotland squad. Um, Literally two weeks before the tournament, the head coach, Doug Riley, called me up and said, I hear you're back in Scotland, you know, that due to some family circumstances that one of the coaches couldn't go, had to pull out last minute. And he was like, I heard you're back. Do you want to come? So I didn't really know Doug massively well at the time. Um, so I said, yeah, absolutely. I heard Doug in quite high, high regard. He's quite, quite big in Scottish basketball. Um, and I thought it'd be a really good chance to work with him, someone at his level. So... Went, went away to the tournament in Macedonia, I think it was. Um, you know, we, we were away for three weeks. You know, we had absolutely, an absolutely great time. You know, we're both on court, we're coaching wise, both off court, we clicked really well. Um, and it ended up that once we came back, you know, I was trying to figure out which team I was going to go and coach with just sort of as a, as a hold in. I was possibly going to go back to Dunfermline, so I was living there at the time, um, possibly back to Falkirk, you know, Team in but uh, other team in Edinburgh, but in Uradas, that I was potentially going to go and coach there. Um, but off the back of that tournament and having a great time with Doug, I was he asked me if I wanted to come to Edinburgh. I was like, you know, absolutely, I'll go to Edinburgh. Um, and then from there, it just sort of grew where Edinburgh, Edinburgh wanted to invest in me and they sort of built, they worked towards getting a full time coaching position. It was through uh, the DCI, Direct Club Investment. Um, I think I'm not sure if that's a Scottish or a British investment. I think yeah, I think that might be a Scottish yeah. investment. Yeah. But yeah, so we we got we got DCI money, which funded a full time job for me for four years, um, which initially was 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 huge. It was you know the first sort of job of its kind in Scotland, and yeah. from there I've did, we've just sort of grown our program from initially started with just extra skill workouts and working with some of the teams, and we've managed to grow it so that we now we've got an academy, we've got um, we've got another full-time coach that works here. We've got, we took the jump to move from playing in the Scottish leagues to playing in the English leagues. We had to go through the ranks and get promoted to the, the English Premier. It's, it's been been quite a quite an interesting journey from there, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the people at Edinburgh for wanting to invest in me early and you know helping me get to the stage I'm at just now. That's great, uh, and and I appreciate you saying exactly what that what that structure looks like at this moment. One quick question: It's a very you know it's a definite right angle question. Um, yeah. How far away away are you or someone in Scotland to establish a full time academy which could kind of rival some of the stuff that's happening in England? Um, so we're we're getting close with our one. So we we started up an academy. It would have been about 2017, I think, or 2018 was the first year that we, it was 2017, the first year that we had an academy. We got a link with Edinburgh College um, and, you know, we tried, we tried to build it up to the level where we could get to the level of some of the EABL stuff. There's quite a lot of challenges um, in the way from us getting the same as what EABL or ABL academies have. And one of the big ones being in Scotland is it, it's, it's very difficult to get kids to move school. Yeah. Um, so we we don't have sixth form in Scotland. So once you go once you go to high school, that's it. You generally stay at that school. Yeah. Um, so all of the kids that we work with are spread out over about ten to fifteen different schools in Edinburgh. 
Um, so it's very difficult for us to get us all to one place. So what, what we've done is we've got a link with Edinburgh College um, and we have the classes as sort of evening classes. Um, so all our training happens from four o'clock onwards so that the kids can still go to school, you know, their, all their schools that they're spread out in. Then they can come and play for us um, and train with us every, every, every night. So we'll train every day. We'll get as close to a program as what you would um, and, and practice as the, as the English academies. So we'll, we'll train every day. We've got full-time S&C coach. We've, you know, we've got physios that come in and work with our guys. It's, you know, yeah. a, full, a full program in with them. The biggest challenge is we, we have inquired many times about trying to get into EABL or ABL. And you know, I've no doubt that we could do it on a, on a skill level point. We would, we would be there or thereabouts, not, not for the, the top end guys, but we'd be able to compete. Sure. Um, but, our biggest issue is, is games. We wouldn't really be able to get there because we'd have to take the kids out of school on a Wednesday to travel all the way down to, you know, less Charmwoods or yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Char Charmwood would be a, a seven or an eight hour drive. Um, so it, it, that's the bit that becomes quite challenging for us. So mm, that's, that's a, I mean, I mean, that's something obviously for the future because you know yeah. I'm sure. I mean, not everyone knows this, but um, you know not just your club, but, you know, Scottish basketball in general, but I know you yourself have furnished some of these top academies in, in England with some yeah. of their very best players in the past four or five years. And, uh, you know, those players could, if there was a correct structure or should have not, you know, not be leaving, you know, an establishment such as yourselves, if, if it was, if there was an ability to actually compete at a high level. Yeah. So what I'd, we try and see it as you know, we use that to make decision to enter the English Great. national leagues. So we we started off in the conference. We got promoted up. We now play in play as part of the Premier. We're in the North Premier. We do pretty well in that division. Um, and I, the way I see it just now is we can use that to push guys into the right situation. So I've got we've got some guy. I've got a guy down at Barking Abbey just now. We've got some guys playing at, at Myers Co. Um, it, it's trying to find the right situation for guys when they move out here. Some of the guys can go away and play abroad or in the States. And sure. So it's where it's something we would really like to do to be able to play in the EABL logistically. It's, it's quite it's kind challenging. Of so yeah. we'll, for now it's the, the English national national league is where we're at. That's so. awesome. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Um, we'll come back to that whole situation in a minute. Um, let's start talking now, now about this kind of parallel um, you're, you're in the Scottish junior national team program from a very young age. Um, when was your first experiences with the Great Britain um, programs? And, and was that something that you said you had set a goal, which is great. I love to, um, you know, we, we as coaches are always telling players, you know, you must have a goal, you must goal set, you must do this, you must have a vision. Um, and as coaches, I find a lot of the time, especially with younger coaches, they don't have a few pure vision. You know, when I started, um, you know, when right my early career, we, you know, my goal was to produce, you know, next level professional players and to win national junior championships. But the, the shortest term goal was to beat East London Royals and Hum Flong because he was our direct competition. So these were goal setting. You've got, you've already explained that you had this goal and you wanted to be in the Commonwealth Games. Was there some other stuff along the way, such as being involved in the Great Britain junior programs? Yeah, so with that being the end goal, I sort of thought my, my process was the way through. So when I first started, it was just, I wanted to progress through the Scottish national teams. I started with 14s, I went to 16s, I then went to 18s. Um, from all those teams, I went from being assistant to being head coach as well. Um, so those were all just part, next step goals. All right, okay, I'm the assistant for the under 18s team now, now I want to be the head coach for the under 18s. Um, then I can't remember which year was the, it must have been three years ago or four years ago now, last year was a, a missed year, um, that the under 16 Great Britain team, that was the first year they competed together um, because we'd been, we'd been separate Scotland and England before that. Um, and James had got the head coach for the under 16 GB team. And um, I remember I really wanted the chance to work with James again because we'd got on really well at Medway. Um, and as soon as he got the, the head coach for that, I wanted to make sure I, I 
put my hat in the ring to be an assistant there um, you know, and was selected as an assistant coach position and worked with them for the last last three years, well, last four years, if you don't include, include last year, but three European championships um, with James, which were, was a very, it was excellent experience to work with him again and, you know, work with a, another higher level of players than what we were used to from Scotland under 16s or even Scotland under 18s um, to work with those Great Britain guys um, was, a, was a great experience. And, you know, unfortunately the tournament getting cancelled last summer, um, that would have been the next stage of getting to, I was going to coach the uh, under 18s at Euro A, um, which was the next part of one of my goals was to, to coach at Euro A. Um, wasn't sure exactly if that would come via directly via an appointment or hopefully getting promoted with one of the teams I was working with. But you know, the tournament didn't go ahead last summer, so we'll have to wait and see what happens with this year and possibly next year. Yeah, um, with the restrictions. So, and is there anyone in this uh, kind of journey that's um, that's been you know, like maybe mentoring you or um, giving you advice? I mean, where what? Who, who, who are some people that you've, you know, that you, you know, obviously there's people like James that you're constantly um, in communication with and um, Jesse and these type of, what, what other people are, are involved with some of these decisions as well? Yeah, I think James is probably one of the most consistent guys that I've been in, in touch with all the way through. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with lots of different guys that I've had interactions with over a short period of times, but J James has been pretty consistent right from you know, I still remember my interview with Crusaders where you know the coaches were all sitting at the side of the court we had to go on court and coach a session um but right right from then he's, he's been pretty consistent as a person I've spoke to and look up looked up to don't tell him I said that but, no <laughs> uh, <laughs> um all the way through my journey um I've worked with for the last oh I can't remember how many years now probably five years it'd be quite a bit before the Commonwealth started um, I've, worked, I've had a, a dedicated coach mentor. So Basketball Scotland had a mentoring program that started quite a while ago. Um, he's called Bob McGowan. He's actually he comes from a, a rugby and volleyball background and doesn't know no direct basketball experience. Um, I guess his only basketball experience is through me, but I've had a lot of really good chats with him just about, you know, sort of the off-court management side of things that helped me with my, you know, coaching, but then also helps me with my bigger goal setting and you know decision making process all the way through his team so he's really pushed me to go on to do various things and you know he's he's a very a very smart man that's you know it's quite I, I find it quite a valuable resource to have someone that I can speak to that's not necessarily part of basketball either that you know I can still learn quite a lot from in a coaching sense yeah so um you know wrapping up this the, the national team stuff obviously you know you talked about this goal of uh, getting to the Commonwealth Games and um, you know you you were able to fulfill that and have you know an incredible experience as well um, I mean talk to me about that because you know really truthfully this was you know there was a generation a huge you know an incredible you know, to have Kieran and to have Gareth specifically and, you know, all of the other players that were involved in that program, you know, there yeah. was the, the resource there um, to have a great experience. And then obviously, um, you know, the, the whole of the, the, the process, you know, talk to me about uh, that and the fact that you were able to, to beat England and to, to achieve what you did. Yeah. Um, I think, I think really, a really important part of the process was, you know, a lot of credit has to go to Barry, buying through Basketball Scotland. He got all the right people together at the right time. So, you know, obviously got all the guys working with yourself at the Rocks. Um, you know, had, we had all those main sort of Scottish players were there. Um, it was six of them from that, that one situation, which obviously forms a really important part of that bond that the team had all the way through. Um, you know, I, I tried to get around as much as I can. You know, I worked from... Um, the summer before we had prep games against Ireland. So I'd, you know, got into position when I was assisting the, the prep games against Ireland. And we had some other um, games up that went all the way through to the lead up to the Commonwealth Games. And obviously we had the, the change to working with Rob um, was, was all very um, sort of challenging at first to work with. There was a lot, a lot of chopping and changing with what was going on, but the consistent there was a couple of consistents all the way through that, you know, guys like Kieran and guys like Gareth were such important 
parts of that journey that you know that even though I was in a position where I was coaching them at the time I actually learned a lot from them as sort of leadership guys being around you know excellent professional basketball players um that then lead through to the, the games themselves yeah um, and did you what was the what were the type of things that you learned from from coach rob um you know huge experienced australian coach um you know an incredible has a you know very very distinct coaching style what were some of the things that you learned from him i think with with rob you know he's his ability to get guys to buy in. You know, I remember we, we sat in a, in a meeting at the Emirates um, and it was the first time he had spoke to all the players and he gave us out, it was a single sheet of A4 paper. He gave out everyone and he read through these, like these are our goals, these are what we're going to do. And it was very detailed down to the number of possessions that we wanted to have per game. You know, we, wanted to, we, we wanted to shoot 30 free throws a game. And I remember some of the players being like, well, why are, we, why are we trying to shoot 30, 30 free throws per game, for example? And um, his ability to just simplify everything and be like, okay, we, we, want, we want to stop the game a lot so that we can have these little mini timeouts that he liked to use. So that meant getting to the free throw line so it stops the game more so we can get, you know, meant he could use these situations where he changes up his defense. Um, and he just simplified everything and, and got really good personal relationships with all the players and the staff that, everyone was ready to run through a brick wall for him, you know, and as, as soon as it came to, to the games, you know, we, right from day one of arriving there, you know, being in the hotel and they say, being around the English guy, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, we we're going to compete against England. It was right. We knew we were there to beat them. You know, we, that was always our goal. Um, and we knew that we had a chance to do it. Um, and Rob made us believe that we had a chance to do it. And, you know, we obviously, in the end we, we did, it was a, a, a hard fought game and, uh, you know, the, the guys were played superb. They worked their asses off and we got to a stage where, you know, we played a semi-final game against Australia. Yeah. It was absolutely. incredible. Yeah. Um, what what have you taken uh, from Rob and that experience into your coaching and that you use on a, on a daily and weekly basis? Yeah. I think th those personal relationships are really important. That was something I always valued before anyway, but... Um, seeing how Rob does it, did it with the guys, it made me really value how important it is to have a relationship with every single one of your players. Um, you know, so one, one of the rules that he had, um, cause so Rob came in at the last real last minute was before the tournament. So he didn't know all the players as, as you would want a coach to know he's all the way down to the 12th guy. So one of the things for the games was, um, I, I did all the subs. So I did all the rotation for all the players going on and off. Um, and the only rule he gave with me was he said, you can, you can do anything you want. You can sub guys at any time. The only rule is all 12 guys have to play every game. Wow. Um, awesome. And I was like, okay. And I was a little bit like, I was, yeah. like, so I was thinking, I was like, this is the Commonwealth Games. Are we not, you know, we got to yeah. focus. He's like, no, it's really important because it's particularly with a tournament play that all 12 guys are invested in the team. You, yeah. We go and we only play 10. There's two guys at the end of the bench that are like, they're not ready to play because they know sure. they're not going to play. Sure. Um, so we had the, our two youngest guys were 16 and 17 years old. So Callum Lowe and Sean Neal and Lino. Um, and we, had, we got them in every single game and they played at, at the games. Um, and it meant that, so Rob's sort of philosophy on that was that all the, all the guys are then invested in the team. And so Callum knew he was going to get two or three minutes yeah. When he goes on for those two or three minutes, he was going to give absolutely everything that he had to the team. You know, and you just off the top of my head, he had a really nice play against England for an assist with Thali. You know, he had a couple of shots against India, I think. And, um, you know, it, it made all the players feel really valued. And it helped with that ethos that he was trying to create where, you know, everyone really wanted to, to fight and come together for the team. So, sure. you know, something and I always you, try and make sure. And if you put that into your club coaching now and then – subsequently it probably will be in the national team coaching yeah so i've you know I've, I've definitely tried to make sure i always make sure my players feel valued you know even you know as, as last year you know top, top end top of the table games against other teams in the north premier i'd always make sure i get all the guys in the first half get them a chance to play get them make them feel comfortable because you never know what's going to happen in a game your top three guys fell out or get injured and all of a sudden you have to play one of your guys that's lower down on the bench so 
least you know they're not going to be like rabbit in the headlights. So yeah, that's that's something I'll, I've always tried to do definitely since then um, and, and make sure it really sort of feeds into the, the um, player relationship side of things. That's a, that's a really interesting one. I mean, I've seen uh, and have actually been involved in, you know, teams that have done one or the other. I mean, I always, uh, you know, my philosophy uh, when it comes to practice is always mixing fives together and never having a first five versus a second five. Um, unless it's right at the end of the week in, in preparation. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen some coaches, though, that will only play the first five for the whole week of practice, will only play seven players. Um, so it's a very, very, very interesting um, point. And I, I hope younger coaches will really think about that and, and how that possibly does impact um, the cohesion and uh, the group the, uh, group dynamics. Very, very good, good, good coaching point. Um, Coming out of the Commonwealth Games, uh, let's just slightly change tack because I want to come back to your career and where you're going in a minute. But um, let's talk about, first of all, uh, the British British coaches, the coaching fraternity. What, what you, You're definitely, you know, in a, in a unique position. You're a senior coach. You're a rising star coach at the same time. Um, but you're also detached from the bulk of coaches that are based in, in England specifically. Um, what, do you feel there's a fraternity of coaching in Scotland, first of all? And also, do you feel like any kind of relationships and the fact of what we've got here in, in England stroke Scotland and as, as the UK? Yeah. Um, so in, in Scotland, it's, it's a lot smaller version. So bas basketball across the board is a lot smaller just in terms of numbers in Scotland. Um, there's there's a, a small, I was on a call about two nights ago um, with a bunch of Scotland coaches um, just talking about stuff. So there is a, there is a, a, a coaching fraternity in Scotland. It's, it's, quite, it's quite diverse in terms of the age groups. There's quite, there's quite a big group of older coaches um, and I get on quite well with a lot of them. And then there's a big sort of age gap in the middle and um, sort of around my age, a little bit older than my age. There's not many coaches around there. Then there's quite a lot of good younger coaches just now as well. So um, a lot of those calls are pretty good to get um, a good link between sort of the older, more experienced coaches and then myself with the younger coaches as well. Um, in terms of the, the English slash British side of the coaching fraternity, I've, I've got a lot of good close relationships with a lot of different clubs um, across England. Uh, I think it's one of the things that we do, we've done pretty well as part of being in the English Premier and part of all the experiences that I've had through national teams and stuff is we've, I've got really good relationships with a lot of people. Um, so just guys like Troy Cully or Neil Hopkins or you know Will Maynard who was on here a couple of weeks ago. I've, you know, I'll chat to these guys a lot. You know, you just text message or we've got group chats with some of them and our uh, the North Premier, we've got a, a coaches group chat in the, the North Premier coaches awesome. where we just ch sometimes chatting about stuff in the league, but sometimes just chatting about general basketball stuff or players. And it's, uh, yeah, it's re really good. I, I, I don't feel like there's a gap between being Scotland and England in terms of that good. side of things. So good. Yeah, it's, it's got a, a lot of good close relationships. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good to hear. It's one of the more positive messages uh, that I've got to hear as well. Um, do you think how, how do you think we can better our our coaching as a as a as as the UK and you know also you know our coach education programs? What any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think it's been. I've always found when I'm going when I've gone through from just starting out to now, it's always been really hard to get time to go on courses so there's a lot of coaches that are in certainly my position I you know do loads of different things so your weekends get full very quickly and I can understand why people find it difficult to get to coaching clinics I think one of the important things that we should take from lockdown um, was these online clinics that you know Alan was leading and Neil were leading um, where we had these Zoom calls where you know, some of the hot seat staff are getting some big name coaches in to deliver X, Y, or Z clinics. Um, I thought that was really, really useful. And it was in a format where it becomes accessible to so many more people. If you, had, if you have a one course in Manchester, for example, 
it's very difficult for people outside of that area to get there. Whereas if you're doing stuff, we should use the technology a lot more. We use technology as much as we can in terms of video stuff. So why, why aren't we using it more in terms of our, our learning? Mm. Um, so I, th I think that was one of the big things that it was one of the things I enjoyed about lockdown was being able to sit on calls with yourself and, and some of the other coaches from the fraternity and, and listen to some really high level knowledgeable guys talk about basketball. So do you that's think something that we can keep going? Are you finding the so you're what you're also you know saying as well is that you're finding younger coaches are integrating and are coming to you? Um, are they coming to you? you know, for advice or are they, you know, is it because these are structured type things? Um, you know, is there, you see that there's a drive to, to get better from the younger, younger coaches that you're dealing with. Yeah. Um, so in, in Scotland right now, it's quite, it's quite structured. We have these sort of, sort of used to be weekly, but it's probably more monthly just now. Um, Zoom calls where we've been chatting about different topics and different planning. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely have. There's been a few coaches that have reached out, um, some of the ex-players and stuff that are just looking for advice and, um, and where to go. So it's, I'm always happy to speak to younger coaches. I always found that when I first started out, it seemed very daunting, particularly being a young coach, being early 20s, trying to integrate with, it seemed like everyone else was at a higher level and knew what they were doing. And I was just trying to rabbit in the headlights kind of thing. But so I can understand why it's, it can seem very intimidating at first, um, but you know it's it's actually it's very rewarding once you can, you know, have the confidence to sort of overcome that and get through your uh, start your coaching journey. Right, and so just taking that in full circle, I mean, what what are your kind of aspirations now for the future? I mean, you're you're full time at uh, City of Edinburgh, you're a national team coach. I mean, what what's what's what do you? I mean, it's never easy to predict next stages in someone's career in basketball coaching, but what are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, both in the short term and also slightly longer term. Yeah. So. Uh, um, after, after the Commonwealth Games, the next goal after that was to, to coach at Euro A, um, which is, will hopefully happen. Um, I know with the, the news of the Olympics and stuff today, it doesn't bode well for this summer coming, but um, all we can do is stay ready that if the summer happens, then we're ready to go. Um, if not, then wait and see what happens going further down the line. But, you know, coaching at Euro A and, and being successful at Euro A is definitely the next target that I want to try and achieve. Um, and yeah, from, from there, it's, I haven't really set a, a long-term goal past that. Um, I've been working a lot with, with club goals and trying to get the club to a point where we're um, a high-achieving team in the, in the English Premier League, um, which I think based on last year, we did pretty well with. Um, the next goal is to sort of be consistent with that. You know, So we, we managed to get ourselves promoted up, but we, we want to be consistently be one of the top teams. Um, in the English Premier and, you know, take it from there. To do that, it takes a lot of investment in our programme all the way through because we, we don't really recruit any players from the outside. We, we'll have one or two kids that will join us, but mm. most of our kids that will play in National League for us played under 12s, under 14s, under 16s. Sure, so sure, it takes yeah. a big investment in sort of the early years to get them to a level where they can compete against, you know, teams where they will recruit players in. It becomes, it makes it a lot more challenging to go up against teams like that. So, are you uh, just do you know? Because obviously, I know a little bit about the geography of the of the country. Um, you know, are you still as a as a nation, and we still missing a lot of those kids in in the Glasgow type region? You know, versus you know you you're maxing out you know, in, yeah. in Edinburgh and then even some of the smaller places above, um, you know, like the Falkirks and stuff. Are you, are you, are you, are, you, are we still missing that in, in a Glasgow um, just because of the kind of, you know, geographical, the, the, the density of that population, the size, yeah. the different types of kids. There's undoubtedly, there's been, there's been a lot of players that came through there. There's one playing at Barkin Abbey just now, Emmanuel, he, he came through, he's from Glasgow, he's played with St. Mirren. Um, six, nine, six, ten kid that's going to go on to some good things. Um, but yeah, I, th I think Gl Glasgow really needs a sort of a big club, potentially the Rocks or someone that would uh, sort of oversee that um, all of the teams in Glasgow and make them into a, 
a hopefully a, a, a good development team. There's definitely a lot of potential there. Um, it's one of the things b- before I went to Edinburgh, that was one of the places I did think about situation, situating myself and seeing if I could start up a team there, maybe link with a university or something. But, you know, that never, it never really worked out that way. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of potential in Glasgow. Um, mm. I, I, before, I, before I finish that stuff up, I mean, um, Again, I, I just don't think, you know, uh, you know, obviously I, I'm a little bit luckier in in the fact that I've been involved and, you know, seen stuff firsthand in Scotland. But even the way before me, there's an incredible history of Scottish basketball. And we're not just talking about, you know, a one off player. I mean, there, you know, you know, the Robert Archibalds, you know, his dad, all of the great players, you know, um, it, it, they were like serious. And then obviously all the way down to Kieran and Gareth and all of these other players, you know, for um, what, what, it, it, there's, there has to be something that can be, be even continuously built, built on that kind of history. Do you think that just the question is more, do you think that you're, you've celebrated that history enough that enough people understand that and that you can really build upon that? Yeah. I'd, I think one of, one of the things that was important off the back of the Commonwealth Games and what we wanted to do as a, as a, as a team and as a, as a federation, we wanted to try and celebrate Scottish basketball and try and build on the success that we had there and get back to, you know, you, know, you see that there was a Sky Sports documentary recently, yeah, very good. Um, which had a lot about basketball through the years and just the amount of people that would go and watch games. It was, you get like football attendances going to basketball games, you know, like thousands and thousands of people. Um, and you would like to think that's something that we could try and get back to. Um, but I don't know what the exact route on how to get there is, but um, there certainly was in the past a, a desire for basketball and the desire to watch and, and support and follow basketball um, up here. It'd be great if we could get back to a situation like that. I'm, I'm hoping that the lockdown and stuff doesn't set us back. It's, it's mm. going to be very difficult for probably basketball over the whole world to recover from um, the current situation. But it's uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot to be celebrated in the history of Scottish basketball that you know, hopefully we can we can build on in the future. Okay, good. Um, three rapid fire questions uh, to nearly finish. Um, favorite all time basketball coach? Um, probably it would be Brad Stevens. Um, I was I was very lucky that I got to meet him um, right at the start of his coaching career. Um, you know, he invited us into his office, we had a good conversation and stuff before he'd even coached the game at Butler. And I remember thinking he would, because he was really young at the time as well, and thought, yeah. this is the guy I want to, want to, you know, follow and see what happens. And, you know, obviously went on to do really good things with Butler and beyond. Oh, that's an awesome story. Great. Um, favorite drill. Um, if you've got one. Yeah. Um, favorite drill is probably shell drill. I love all the, loads of different variations you can do i can i'll often put one or two little rules in every time we do it that changes the drill ever so slightly so we can get the exact focus out of it that we want to do but um you know we'll, we'll start 90 percent of practices one of the first drills will be shell drill okay and uh favorite um go-to saying or statement something you uh, say often yeah it's a, I, I, w- I wasn't really sure what to say i knew this question was coming so i, I asked i asked the players that i work with <laughs> Um, and it was quite some funny answers that I probably can't repeat. But um, the main one is I, I always go on at guys about staying in stands. So apparently throughout most sessions, I'm always shouting stands. Um, and it's, you know, there's one player in particular that I seem to always go after because he's probably our best, most talented player, but he's just always playing upright. Yeah. Um, and it's just trying to get him always in stance. You know, I'll see him in the corridor and walking into the gym stuff and like, shout stands. Awesome. Place. Yeah, it's that, that, hey, that's a, such an important part of the game in anything. Be ready, you know, so ready, absolutely. Yeah, oh, it's great, coach. Um, I mean, we could go forever on a variety of areas and stuff, but um, you know, I really appreciate um, you, you coming on today, and uh, you know, I want to wish you, you know, especially once everything is starting again, you know, uh, continued success because um, you've done an incredible job, you know, to, to from where you started, obviously, to where you are now. And I can only see, you know, success in the future for you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. I've enjoyed listening to all the other podcasts. So I'm 
I'm fun. I'm sure that you know the the young coaches are really going to enjoy listening to this one. So thank you very much indeed again. Well, thank you.